Thank you, Mace, and thanks everyone. Really lovely to be here with you all and lovely to be with our friends online as well. Welcome, hey. <clears throat> no problem, we get settled in. There's cushions, blankets, whatever you need. So this is the Wednesday Night Well of Being. I'm one of the teachers here along with Chandra Easton. And it's such a sweet night. Uh, I often say this, but it, it's often one of the highlights of my week to be here with you all. Partially because it's so unique to be somewhere where we all are deciding to be here for a single purpose, I hope, a shared purpose, which is developing and forging the strength of our heart, our body, and our mind so that we can meet what is facing us on a day-to-day -day basis and we can meet what needs to be faced in our world. This is the training ground. And it's so awesome to be here together with that shared purpose and to be in a space, just as Mace described, that's one of generosity. So we're all here because of generosity for folks who are um, offering their time and effort. <clears throat> Everything from the decoration of the center to where the chairs get aligned is done so with that kind of heartfelt aspiration. So just really kind of savoring that. And it's so beautiful. And it's really important to us here at the Dharma Collective that we create a space where folks can feel at ease um, and folks can feel welcomed. That's not always easy to do. We, we might make mistakes. There's a lot of uh, different lived experience that folks have here that we might not be aware of. And um, it's important to us that, you know, we would always love to hear reflections and feedback directly or written, however you feel comfortable of a way we can make this space feel inviting and comfortable. Part of the work we do here is guided meditation, of course. We'll use some teachings that we go through together. <clears throat> and then the core part is our reflection and discussion. And just as a reminder that that reflection and a discussion is just as much a part of our practice as, as the meditating. Because when we are speaking, we're actually kind of bringing to life or bringing almost into the future ideas and words that might guide us. And when we're listening to other people, we have a real opportunity to listen in this unique way of not like judging, <laughs> but actually enacting a kind of empathy and compassion as we listen. And not thinking about how we might say it differently or <clears throat> what we might want to say next. So it's really interesting to bring this practice of sharing both what we're saying and what we're bringing forth into the room and listening as part of our practice. So I really invite that for all of us. We've been fortunate that a lot of us who come here come together uh, every week. And we are also so delighted when new folks are showing up or old faces return. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> it's such a great um, kind of experience every week as we see these different ingredients come together and a lot of the topics we cover are just the foundational topics what's in the way of our awakening what does our heart most desire how can we have a deeper connection with true well-being and this week i i hope this will be uh good news for some of you there's some folks in the room who like it when we just get raw and deep the shame and the disgust and the fear and the pain but this week all positivity it's okay it's not gonna be toxic positivity but it's nice it's nice to focus on what's good and to really create conditions for feeling good so we're going to do that in two ways i know you all started this book last week with chandra so it's called boundless healing by tulku dundup and it's interesting. It's an interesting book. Um, he has written other books where there's a bit more of that kind of like getting into the guts and the hard stuff. This book is really like, let's heal now. Like we need to feel good. We need to resource goodness here and now. And very practical ways. He takes very esoteric teachings that often involve such complex visualizations. I don't know how anyone could ever hold them in mind and makes them just like really concrete and on the ground as ways again to enhance and enrich our sense of goodness and positivity. 
So we're going to do two practices tonight. Um, instead of doing one longer one, we're gonna do two shorter ones. Sometimes that's nice anyway at the end of the day. Um, and the first practice is really gonna be focusing on kind of savoring goodness. I'm gonna give you a little bit more preamble to that one than just dipping right into the meditation. And then the second one, this is where we kind of get on the magic carpet ride a little bit, is going to be imagining every cell in our body as light, healing light. Yep. They didn't put anything in your tea. That is what I just said. Um, I've been practicing this actually for a couple months since I started the book as, which he suggests, as a way to go to bed um, or when you wake up in the night. And I find it to be a really beautiful feeling. Some of my other practices with my main teacher, we have different visualizations of light, but this one is quite specific and interesting. So that will be our, our second practice. So before we start um, in this first practice, I, I actually want us to really be able to connect with this idea of, of what is it to find a memory or a feeling that is, that is good. And when he talks about good, He's really talking about a sense of happiness and not because happiness is the ultimate goal, but because sometimes it's hard for us to actually touch peace of mind. So when he's talking about, you know, what is our ultimate goal of practice? What are we really learning to develop? It's peace of mind. So that whatever is happening, we can have it arise from that peace, whether it's something super great, like a delicious meal or something really hard, like reading the news, as May said, that we kind of have this foundation of peace. You could think of it almost as like an emotional resilience protection. But often for us, the peace is so subtle, right? Our lives are so busy, so fast, there's highs, there's lows, hard for us to touch peace. And, and he really suggests that it's a great bridge for us to develop peace of mind by really connecting to what feels good or what feels happy. He suggests we do so in, um, in four different ways that we kind of first just kind of um, hold it in our mind, like as though we are kind of seeing it. And then we actually name it, like what is it that feels good? Then we focus on what it feels like and then a belief that this process of kind of seeing, naming, and feeling could be of benefit for us. So I think it makes sense because especially with visualization, I myself and I know others sometimes struggle with coming up with the right thing. Wait, what is it? I'm visualizing a peaceful, happy place? Like, where is that? I'll offer one, but what I would love if a, a couple folks could share, like what comes to mind. Um, I got the huge benefit of being on retreat last week for seven days. And there was one evening, gosh, I don't know if it was Tuesday or Wednesday. It was when that, you know, Shiva moon was rising, that crescent moon. And I was in a place where I got to sit and watch as the sun fully set and the moon fully rose and just that gradation of color from like dark indigo into fire red. And when I even bring that to mind right now, it feels really beautiful, really peaceful, very powerful experience just being there. Um, kind of cheating because on retreat, it's easier to remember those things. But even, you know, I think the other morning, um, just in my living room, there was a moment where everything just felt kind of good. It was a nice light in the window, it was a nice cup of tea. It doesn't have to be huge experience on retreat. So I'd love to hear from a couple of folks here, what might you think you could bring to mind and get that sense of happiness or peace? And if you don't mind, um, so our friends online can hear using our, our sacred talking stick, AKA the lapel mic. Karen, since you have it, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I was trying to think of something real magical, like the sunset moon, but really all I thought about was my dad. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go with that one. Um, Thank you. Um, now, I've had this experience, almost exactly the same experience a few times, but there's always one time in particular that comes up. And I've been surfing at Ocean Beach um, near Lincoln Street. And I surfed my brains out and was really satiated. And after the end of one particular wave, I was sort of bobbing around inside of the break zone where the white water was sort of breaking here and there. And I was in this place of I could either paddle back out and get a couple more, or it would have been just as easy for me to paddle in and be done. And I remember sitting there, bobbing around, feeling like, this is totally great right here. <laughs> I don't give a shit whether I go back out and get some more or not. Hmm. And and that was, uh, that's, hmm. whenever it comes up, think about something that makes you really happy. It's that particular spot, hmm. you know, and that particular memory. Hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Anyone online, um, Brendan, you can let us know if anyone has anything. Not yet. Anybody want to speak up? We might have a, a quiet crew here. <laughs> okay. So many of you know that Pamela and I have new kittens and uh, <clears throat> we're totally obsessed and um, and they're just delightful. So like just even thinking about the kittens is super fun. But last night I got up in the middle of the night to pee and I like sort of blindly felt around on the bed when I came back just to see where they were and they weren't on the bed. So I went out into the living room and they were on the couch and I just like collected them up and brought them back to bed and then arranged them and just like fell asleep. They just were like super fuzzy and sleepy, so they were compliant. <laughs> and um, they're not always that way and at all. And um, just like fell asleep with my arms around them, totally cranked my shoulder and pinched the nerve in my neck. It was not a good position. <laughs> but oh my God, it was just like little fuzzy purrs. And mm. yeah, so super, super sweet. Mm. Wonderful. <laughs> Maybe just one or two more. We're kind of building the field here. Great. We have this uh, older dog who's like 12 or 13, he's various health issues, uh, diabetes, various other things. And so time spent with him is really, really precious. And he kind of walks in a sort of a creepy way. He's very sweet and he makes friends all over. We took him to the beach every now and then. There's just something about the ocean beach that the sand is really soft and the beach is closed and the, the water, he doesn't like to go in the water, but there's something about the unobstructed landscape and, and he just gets into this gelf and he's sort of saying that he feels he's just, you know, he's this little guy, he's just really you know, just adorable to watch us galloping and of course the sun is on the ocean to try to go find it for sunset. And mm. It's just so heartbreakingly beautiful mm. to appreciate this moment in time mm. and to tap into his Present moment again. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, I think what's so interesting is understandably a lot in the Dharma, we're really focusing on not these extrinsic sources of happiness, right? We're really trying to start kind of, we can think about building the goodness so it radiates from the inside out. But the instruction from this practice is like, bring the light in. Like mm -hmm. it's a different way. Like we can kind of almost ride on the on the brightness 
of the feeling of joy from things that are happening in the world around us too. And he, he doesn't mention this, which I'm, I'm glad about, but there's really good scientific research on what is called savoring. So bringing to mind what's good and holding it in mind. And in pretty intensive research studies with pretty severe clinical depression, the savoring really helps. Helps as much as cognitive behavior therapy. So bringing to mind the good feelings, the positive feelings and holding them. This can't be our only route to the Dharma and we need some help, right? We need some ways to feel good and to generate that and to kind of work with it. So do folks feel like they've had a moment to really come up with an image? Is anyone struggling with, gosh, I don't know. Is there anything I can really bring forward? Could you, hi, my name is Adriana, first time here. Could you repeat the name of the book? Yeah. It is, it's called Boundless Healing. Boundless Healing. I bet some kind, um, Zoom friend might put it in the chat. Boundless Healing by Tulku Thondup. And this is a book of his about 10 years old. Um, so he's a contemporary, grew, grew up uh, in Tibet and he fled shortly after the invasion in 1961. So that was, um, and he's been teaching in the US and worldwide since the early 70s. Yeah, kind of a well-established teacher of our time. So if everyone feels like they can come up with something that they can hold in their mind, that's the way we'll start. And just as a reminder, I imagine Chandra probably also shared this last week. Visualization is not easy for everyone, right? Most of us are accustomed to practices where we're focusing on something concrete our breath or sensations in our body. This is a little different. We're bringing something to our mind and imagination. I happen to think, uh, I, and I don't know the research on this, I happen to think that exercising our imagination is probably more needed than it has ever been because we donate so much of our imagination to screens and we let the screens do the imagining for us in these incredible ways. And yet, like to really develop our own creativity and strengthen what's naturally there. I feel like the visualization practices are very powerful for us right now. So let's go ahead and begin by finding a posture that's supportive. As I mentioned, this will be a shorter practice, more like 15 minutes instead of half an hour, but it's still good to be in a posture where you can balance these two essential qualities of a sense of uprightness through the spine. Not a rigid uprightness, but just this kind of um, springing up, like imagining a tall, fully grown lily on the top of its stem. So having that sense of uprightness, reaching up almost towards the light, and also a sense of softness and ease through the front of the body. So a sense of softness through the face, through the chest, through the belly. And if it feels comfortable, closing the eyes is sometimes more helpful for visualization, but it's also okay to have the eyes slightly open, softly focused in front of you. And it can be helpful to figure out where your hands want to be placed on your lap. Ideally, we want a little openness in the chest. So you could even invite the shoulders to be a bit farther back so that the chest has this spacious feeling.
Let's begin by settling our body in its natural state. Feeling some qualities of stillness. Feeling some qualities of stability and presence. Taking a couple moments to simply notice whatever is easy to notice in the body. Maybe that's the rise and fall of the breath through the belly, sensations of breath through the nostrils, or simply the feeling of the entire body being supported by the chair beneath you. And inviting the inner speech to settle, bringing our attention and energy away from the head, down into the heart and into the belly. And of course, the mind is going to become distracted, caught up in memories or images, sounds or sensations. Just gently coming back to the object of focus, which right now is helping us more deeply settle into our body. And become more quiet internally. continue helping us settle that inner speech and settle our mind. We can narrow and focus our attention on the breath a bit, really following each breath with our attention, almost as though our attention could enter the breath. As we inhale, noticing and knowing we are inhaling. And as we exhale, noticing and knowing we are exhaling, feeling this through the full dimensionality of breath in the body.
Every time the mind wanders is a new opportunity to strengthen our attention. And just come back a couple more moments now, focusing just on the subtle sensation of breath traveling in and out of the body. Really noticing and being with the breath as though it were a precious gift, as though it were slightly different each time. Gently shifting from this focus on the breath and the body to the mind and imagination. Maybe some of the distractions already brought forth other images, memories. We're going to now intentionally bring forth this memory or image of some moment or feeling or experience in which we felt at peace, in which we could sense some joy. If possible, choosing just one memory, maybe there's many examples, but focus in on one. And with as much vividness and richness as possible, bring it to the very front of the mind. See the colors and movement and shapes. And then silently to yourself, consider a word or phrase that describes the goodness of this moment. It could be something simple like feeling everything is okay or peace. But bringing these words to mind, helping us really identify and connect with the goodness of this moment can be a powerful enhancer of the feelings of this moment. Once you've had these words, which can help really shape and understand this experience, we now lean into that feeling, the emotions and the sensations in the body, 
that may arise when visualizing and naming this experience. So we were guiding our awareness to a place of beauty and peace and then letting that awareness just permeate so we could really feel directly the experience, what it's like in the body, the mind, and the heart. If you get distracted and carried away, no problem. Just relax and come back for a bit longer. And nourishing yourself with this enjoyable memory. Letting it saturate the field of the body and the heart and the mind. Allowing it to bring forth those positive feelings and savoring them. And then taking a moment to notice, has there been any shift or change in your body, heart, and mind? Is there a way to identify or feel a connection with this practice? Maybe the feeling is subtle. Maybe it's quite strong. This fourth phase of this practice is really engaging with a sense of belief or connection. Seeing, naming, feeling. And then now inquiring, can I notice a benefit of this practice here and now? Might this practice support me in my peace of mind and well-being? Letting that inquiry just dissolve a bit into the background, coming back to the breath, focusing and riding each breath through the inhale and exhale.
Thank you for your practice. Nobody floated away into an ecstatic state of bliss. I guess that's a good sign. Maybe you did, you just made it back. Be curious to hear how that was for folks. Anything you'd like to share about that practice? And then I'll share some of his direct um, teachings on this. I thought it'd be good to experience it before we went into his elaborate description of it. Any questions or thoughts on that practice? I see Claudia. Yeah. All right. How Hi, you, Claudia. How are you doing? Good. Nice to see you. Yeah, you too. Um, I remembered a an experience I had uh, in Costa Rica in the ocean as well. And this was at a beach that was very peaceful. It was, there were no, hardly any waves and the temperature of the water was just great, you know, uh, warm and, and uh, I was lying on my back mm. and I was, I was being cradled by the ocean and I was just looking at the bright blue sunny sky and uh it was just such an incredible sense of contentment. Hmm. That's how I felt. It was contentment. Like when you said what words come to mind, at first I, I felt joy hmm. and peace. But then I thought it was really contentment because I felt hmm. like at that moment, I needed nothing, nothing. I was in a perfect state of mind and physically I mean it was just so peaceful it was so mm. wonderful and then when you said um, then you have to believe before we started uh, the meditation um, this afternoon I was having some digestive problems and right before we started the meditation I felt my my intestines were really sore mm. and I didn't sit I lie down and uh, as I, as I, as we were kind of going through that phase of, of did any sensations change, I did notice that my soreness had diminished. Mm -hmm. It did change, you know. So I definitely felt the benefit of mm. of, of the meditation, and it was great reliving mm. that experience that beautiful experience I'll never forget and uh and then the benefit yeah wonderful so it, it was great thank you Claudia yeah glad to hear that it had that um kind of easing effect on 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 the gut as well mm -hmm. right and you know of course the mainstream popularization of meditation has come because of this great research showing that indeed a lot of you know, some of the most kind of entrenched and difficult to access um, ailments of our time, lower back pain, gut pain, lots of things that Western medicine doesn't have full power to heal, that these practices can be really beneficial, right? So that's great to feel that um, immediately. Thank you. I'll read one, one pass passage here when he talks about the kind of peaceful mind which I, I really like he says it is possible to feel calm and joyful for no reason at all or even under challenging circumstances the enlightened mind needs no object or sensation for peace to spontaneously arise for the ordinary mind aka all of us um, unless there's something I don't know about one of you woke up while I wasn't paying attention for the ordinary mind, however, it is better to use positive feelings as a starting place. Here's how you can do it. Be aware of the positive. See the positive side of the negative. See everything as positive. And he goes into this detailed description of how to do each of those. So we are really starting just being aware of the positive. That's our first step here. Being aware of the positive side of the negative, maybe next week. Um, 
seeing everything as positive. Wow. High level practice. We might need to go to Costa Rica with Claudia and lay on our backs in the water. Um, I, I love it because he says, I'll, I'll read his description of see the see everything is positive. He says, see the positive in everything and everything is positive. Then it is possible to realize true peace beyond positive and negative. Ultimately, everything can be a source of healing without discriminating between so-called positive and negative. So hard though, right? So hard when we're like in our stuff, when we're feeling like a regret spiral or even shame to be like, this is positive. This is part of my healing. I mean, it's, it can be true. It can be part of our healing. It can be, you know, something we deny, avoid and create a lot of difficulty around for days or years. So I think there's a potential for that. The absolutes might be a little tough. Anyone else on their experience of focusing on the positive? Was it like, well, that's weird. Why are we doing that in meditation? Yes, Karen, I'll bring. So um, I noticed something, maybe it's a question. Um, when we talk about happy and positive, I was wondering what you're talking about. So a lot of people talk about contentment and you know, not needing anything else to be in its place. Uh, I associate that with feeling of safety. Mm. Especially with some memories from my childhood. Yeah. Uh, but then there are happy moments, um, which I think they have reached in some form of delusion. Let's say I have a memory of when I was a teenager reading books, novels from Daniel Steele. Like, you know, that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, it just stays with me and yeah. illusion, which mm. uh, obviously results in pain. Uh, disconnecting from reality and mm. feeling happy, but I don't think like the, the happiness that probably uh, led to some form of disappointment later right? mm. in life. I don't want to realize what the reality mm. is. Um, and let me not read any novels after you know, 18 mm. years after mm. I became 18. Mm. But um, so that's what I was wondering and thinking because some of these memories came to my mind when I was going to. The moments of happiness and yeah. state and all that that are uh, are those called happy moments or do I want to even count on those or remember them because I don't want to reinforce yeah that's such a great question um you know I think it gets to the heart again of like just like a very dharmic concern which is this this genuine happiness sometime we've talked about here this um, unconditioned happiness, like the wellspring of our our deepest um, sense of joy, which is coming from our intrinsic goodness, not from Danielle Steele novels, right? Or um, or even from being cradled in you know beautiful water in Costa Rica, um, and that is considered to be you know a very reliable source of our well being. Sometimes hard to uncover right? It gets covered over, we get distracted, we forget to look there. And then there's a whole other array of kind of stimulus-driven happiness or hedonic happiness, which I don't think we should say across the board is bad or wrong. You know, kittens, for example, dogs galloping. Oh man, that's good stuff, right? And denying it outright, it's, it's like we don't need to. Um, cause we can, again, we can use that kind of as our, um, like fanning our own flame. Sometimes we can rely on what's in, and sometimes we can kind of use the light that's out there and, and use it to help us connect to our own light. And then there's the things that feel good, but aren't good, right? <laughs> like you're saying the delusion or like, you know, eating some kind of food that in the moment is just so satisfying, but we like feel super sick. We don't sleep well. And like, you know, it's like junk food, right? Um, and I don't think, you know, it's funny, he doesn't make that distinction, but I don't know if he, you know, the example he gave in the first chapter is him going through the center of town um, in a really small center of a village in a small village when he was visiting a great teacher and hearing um, these shepherds singing on their horses. 
So that's a very like simple, wholesome, stimulus driven. And I still think though, reading Danielle Steele, so I didn't read Danielle Steele novels, I read Stephen King novels as a kid, so like super dark, right? And yet that feeling of being in my like own world and having an ability to kind of not be engaged with what was going on around me. And I don't know, there there's probably a wholesome within it, you know? And yet I just wanna highlight one other thing you said, which is so interesting is, not wanting to reinforce, right? And our memory is so pliable. It's not in the past, it's in the present. And so what we're bringing forth into the present influences how we see the world. We can change the past. So if you bring forth that memory of the Daniel Steele novel with a, wow, look at this way that I was able to kind of resource myself at that time as opposed to like check out or deny, then it could possibly be different. But I'm curious, what do you what do you think about that? Are there wholesome parts of the kind of delusional fantasy? Yeah, that's the positive and negative. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but as we think about it, it's interesting to uh, think about it in this way that, you know, just getting lost in, in the world, in my own world and, you know, disconnecting, I mean, there, there could be some use of that sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mostly I've always looked at it more of a negative. Yeah. Point. Yeah. Um, um but I I'll think about it more. Yeah. But and, it's good to have that distinction, you know, between yeah. different kinds of happiness. Totally. And at some point I thought I'm really incapable of being happy without a stimulant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's uh, certain conditions need to be there. Like, I would have to feel really well in order to, you know, be happy or um, that kind of happiness, which you said, genuine happiness. Yeah. Right? Uh, it needs certain conditions to be there for me to realize that. Yeah. So um, that Daniel still is uh, stimulant driven. Right. Yeah, and it's not so binary. And and I love actually what you said in the very beginning of safety, right? And a sense of safety, that's happy, right? That is, because it there's belonging, right? There's a sense of like, okayness. And, you know, even if we can drop into a sense of safety in our own body and mind, that's hard for a lot of us, a lot of the time. And that you know, it does take certain conditions. I I think it's important to keep, you know, a real sense of belief that is here, even if it has been maybe, um, yeah, like bruised, you know, or hurt. Um, some some folks here know I'm I'm taking a little bit of um, time away from work right now, which is a really amazing opportunity for me and I'm getting to feel my own mind a little bit more um, without all the things to do every single day and re actually having that sense of trust that my own mind can be like this really spacious calm place not just a to-do list right so it can take a while to regain that trust with our mind and you know, I think I do. It's funny. I mean, it's funny we're reading this book. I had a lot of resistance, I'll be honest. Chandra knows. I was like, oh no, positivity. Because I really, there's so much toxic positivity. It makes people feel bad about feeling bad. Feeling bad is good, right? It's part of our like natural palette of experience. And yet, it is really nice to also be able to focus on what supports us. I do think it helps us build a sense of safety if we can feel good. And, you know, we're, re we're, we're sourcing from a, from a memory, but we are bringing the goodness here without needing to go out there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any other thoughts? I'm going to share a little bit more of, of his. his uh, yes. I have a, a question, but I don't know if it's appropriate to ask it now or wait till next week. 
because when you're talking about or the author of the book talking yeah. about being aware of the positive even in the negative um it brings to mind the uh, gratitude and mm -hmm. how we're supposed to be grateful of everything that happens regardless of whether it's positive or negative and it yeah. makes, me, makes me think sometimes how, how many times negative thing ha things happen to us but then all of a sudden or not all of a sudden but maybe after a while in retrospect we think well that's the best thing that could have happened to me or yeah or the lessons that we learned from the negative things yeah but but sometimes it seems like nonsensical I mean personally sometimes it's like why the hell do I have to give thanks for something bad that happened right yeah. I mean it's like how how can that make sense? I mean, yeah. Can, can you elaborate? Or do you want to do that now? Yeah. Or do you want to do it next week? I don't know. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll give it a, a moment because I, I think it's a great question and and it is one of the reasons I I shy away from positivity. So I I have so many beloved respected colleagues in the field of positive psychology, and I I hold a lot of concern sometimes with that that field in that there is this emphasis on feeling good, being happy, you know, flourishing as this um, way that we are avoiding what's hard. And whatever is hard, let's just make it good. And mm. I think that there's, there can be a wisdom process through that. If we take the time with what's hard, before we rush to make it good. If we don't really give ourselves time, I, I really think we can end up kind of just suppressing the negative hmm. and bypassing the difficult. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to your point, Claudia, I think the purpose isn't to think that bad things that happen to us are good, but mm -hmm. really what, you know, what is the meaning we can make? What is the learning we can gain? Exactly. And as you said, like over time, what might be revealed? Mm -hmm. from this difficulty but I mean again looking at the news you don't want to be like oh that sounds terrible but that's probably just going to be good <laughs> <laughs> like, that's ridiculous right. that's not helpful <laughs> right like that's actually pathologically terrible right mm -hmm. so there's a real like I, I think it's I actually think it's like a little dangerous you know I do think you need to be like a dharma practitioner to hold these practices in the balance and to recognize this is one tool. This is one way of like bringing in again, some strength so that I can keep seeing things as they are cutting through delusion, you know, and moreover, like doing everything possible in this world to make it better. The world really needs our help, but the world doesn't need our help. If we're mired in despair, the world needs our help when we feel resourced and when we feel like we have some love. So I think it's, yeah, I think one of the pitfalls of focusing on positivity is it can feel very self-focused and very self-absorbed. Like I want to feel good for me and about me because this is going to be good. Forgetting that it's for the good of all beings. Ultimately, if you want to be happy, that's what you should focus on. And if we want our planet to survive, of course, that's what we focus on. And that's kind of our birthright. It's how we have survived as a species. So thank yeah. you. Good question. Yeah. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit. Um, so this is, we, we went into what he calls the four healing powers of mind. He said the four healing powers are positive images, which we did, words, feeling, and belief. And that bringing these qualities of mind to our meditation strengthens the power to heal our mental, emotional, and physical afflictions. I love it when you're like a, a tulku and you write a book, so you don't have to put any citations. I'm like, We're... okay, guess it heals all that. You said so. <laughs> I'm going to go with it. Um, so in the positive images, he says, when we visualize positive objects, the exercise of our imagination engages and absorbs our mind just love that idea that these images it's like it's like saturating inside of us 
If we can maintain these images in our minds for some duration, the healing will be more intimate and more effective. The mind tends to wander about, especially if we're new to meditation. But if we practice staying with the image as long as we comfortably can, our concentration will improve. This is such an important point, is visualization practices are attention training. So we often think of attention training as, you know, right there at the sensation of breath at the nostrils or that candle flame. But visualization is a very powerful tool for developing our attention. And then he talks about the positive words. Medita meditating upon an image is made all the stronger when we recognize the image as positive and even comment to ourselves on its positive nature. For example, if we're visualizing a flower, we might think about its positive qualities. This beautiful flower is blossoming. Or its color is so spectacular. The whole atmosphere is radiant with its brilliance. Or the dew is dripping from its healthy, fresh petals. So this is, uh, you know, how you can get very specific even and kind of more, um, you know, really bringing forth these beautiful qualities. Sometimes just the conscious recognition of positive qualities is enough without a label, but a label can help open our minds to an image, simply saying to ourselves, it's beautiful or it's red. The point is to confirm in our minds the power of the positive. In this way, we begin to transform the negative mindset we have built up. So I think it's funny because if, if we were doing this meditation on um, bringing to mind an image of something horrifying or terrible or worrisome, we'd all have no trouble, right? Like that's like our everyday mind, right? And then label it like, oh man, things are bad. No, they're real bad. Then believing it, oh yeah, this is bad. So it's so funny that like the positive is like, oh, this is weird. Why are we doing that? Because it's our habit, right? Is and it, it makes sense. Like that is a way that we can respond to our environment to feel safe. Like I'm gonna think about all these things that might be wrong so I can anticipate them and avoid them. But this positivity, it really does strengthen that other way of I'm gonna remember and highlight what's already good. Because even in like pretty difficult circumstances, not all the time, but for many of us, a really, really stressful day includes some moments that are okay. And we can also remember those. So I think appreciate him on that. And then he says, with positive feeling, the mind not only thinks and recognizes, it feels. If we involve our awareness of the positive qualities of an object through emotion, the healing of the mind and body is much stronger. For example, in meditation, if we imagine a beautiful flower, we might just think how beautiful that flower is. But then the positive impression is a shadow of what it could be. Instead, we can open up to the flower on the level of feeling. Feel the enchanting beauty, the freshness of the dew dripping from it, the clarity of its colors, like immaculate light. We can feel the qualities of the flower in our hearts and bodies and celebrate the flower instead of thinking about it intellectually. So I like that distinction, right? Because even if you bring it vividly to mind, it might just still be like an image in your head and you label it, beautiful dew, dripping flower, and maybe you get the feeling, but that sensation, right? That really does, it is instructive for our body, heart, and mind to be able to feel that sense of goodness. Did folks connect to the feeling part of whatever memory they brought to mind. What, what, is, what was it? What did you feel? It's so hard to describe, but curious. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, Welcome. Awesome. Uh, so, visualization and I ended up at this really specific kind of random, well, not really anymore, specific memory that I had when I was in elementary school. And 
it was like one of those nights where you go to school in the evening and you go to the book fair or some kind of assembly where your friends need to come. And I remember just like being in the courtyard with my dad and mm. I was being held by him. It's like that small. Mm. Maybe it was my brother and dad or something. Uh, and my mom was there and my brother was there. I just really like visualized the mm. tactile and like olfactory uh, sensation. Mm. And when my dad was wearing his leather jacket mm. and Type <laughs> um, I just remember like really specific things like his hair had gel in it, mm. that my mom was shorter than us, mm. and, like it was dark outside, mm. and we were on concrete, and I just mm. kind of like mm. realized that I felt so good, and that's something that I think took a lot of childhood and uh, family memory that I can like go back to. Mm. I think it it comes back to that feeling of being surrounded hmm. and hmm. thank you so much for sharing that really sweet yeah and that like sense of connection and I like I love that koala type person I totally got it like hanging on there it, it's funny as you mentioned it I had like thought of like you know when you fall asleep in the back of the car like, the, like just that sense of being cared for right and um yeah and again it's so interesting because you're not it, you know technically it's not inside of you where this goodness is coming from but actually it is inside of you it's a memory that has been infused through your mind body system and again you know whatever we are kind of strengthening the pathways for so we can bring to mind things that are difficult and hard but we can also kind of really you know use as a resource these memories that have that sense of being surrounded or connected or held yeah thank you yeah anybody else or like on the feeling side of that practice I don't know if I have a lot to say, but I have a nine-year-old. Mm. Um, she is very snuggly, and we are very close. She's about to fall. So I can feel, and when I, I only have her half the time. Um, so when we reunite a couple times a week after she's been at her dad's for a couple days, it's very sweet. And many times a week that are very sweet, but um, I'll pick her up from school, and she wants a big hug, and so like I can feel... Um, just the closeness there and the um I can feel how soft her braid is and I can feel just the feeling of kind of the weight of her mm. on me and then I can feel the the emotion what inside me like yeah the expansion in my chest and I can feel it down my arms and my finger and like, yep. like the the feeling of loving your child it's really nice mm. god it feels good to listen about it <laughs> that's good right and that empathetic joy or just we are hardwired for for resonance with one another so that's like a really um yeah a beautiful way to <clears throat> like feel the connection you know hear your experience but also like feel the connection internally and he, he doesn't mention that at least in these first chapters and a lot of the things he describes is bringing our own memories but of course, the practice of empathetic joy in the Brahma Viharas, it really is rejoicing in that goodness of having a beautiful memory or feeling connected. Um, you know, and I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's really interesting to kind of cultivate this inner resource and, and do so with the specificity of like the feeling, the words. And the belief was actually the hardest one for me um, until I started thinking about placebo and we know how beneficial placebo is, right? The mind has its own capacity to heal itself. And so I invited us in, in the practice, just consider for ourselves in the moment, is this helping? Does this feel good? Which is the classic teaching of the Buddha, right? Come and see for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Um, and so I, I like that idea. And what he says is, um, 
We might think that by believing, we're only pretending to do something. If necessary, we should go ahead and pretend that we believe, but we should do so with all our heart and feeling. Remember that actors can call up emotions fully by pretending, but only if they believe in the roles they are playing. It's funny, some about like deep acting versus surface acting. And, you know, it's as you described so beautifully, it's like that rush of feeling in the body. Our, our emotions are in our bodies. They're not just a mental state. And so being able to connect to that, you know, embodied awareness of our experience. Um, and so he says, meditation with the four healing powers is a very effective remedy for a for a harvest of negative consequences. And here he's talking about karma and actually saying that by bringing forth these positive images to mind, we're infusing our mind stream with positive states. And that since so much of a kind of negative mind states lead to negative actions and negative consequences, right? Or however you want to think about karma and that works for you. If we are thinking about positive mind states, or also, it's, there's been beautiful research. When people receive kindness, they are more likely to be kind. So thinking about like really you know, connecting to these positive mind states, we are much more likely to have probably an openness, maybe a kindness towards others, maybe a way of seeing the world that's a little bit less rough than before we started. So it's a really... Yeah, I'm being slightly won over on um, positivity. And then it's interesting because he says that uh, there's a really, there's a wrong way to do this practice, which I appreciate. And he says, a grasping attitude can spoil our meditation or dilute its benefits. Even if our meditation uses positive images, words, feelings, and belief, we can be too forceful in how we apply these qualities of the mind. We can start craving mental image or object, straining after its positive qualities, or wanting the meditation to be better or more wonderful than it is. We can use anything, right, for craving and for um, having a sense of kind of loss and longing. But I could see that, right? You know, I, I could imagine bringing forth a positive memory, especially of a time long gone. And you can have that sense of beauty and kind of refreshment from it but you could also be like oh that time is so far away those people aren't even around anymore that i'll never feel that way again I, I just need to meditate on it again right so like how do we it's really just like how do we hold it lightly like if we're going to bring and invite these qualities in how do we not make them yet another source of our craving right because it's so hard we like what we like and we want more when it feels good. So it's, um, I appreciate it. He didn't try to soften it. He just said the wrong way. <laughs> uh, the right way. Um, a goal of healing is to release stress and pressure. If we are open and relaxed, a more peaceful state of mind is possible. This doesn't mean falling asleep, being lazy or spacey. Neither does it mean being forceful or aggressive. Not too tight, not too slack is the right balance. And, um, you know, it's really interesting. He says that this practice is a really good one to start any meditation. And I noticed myself on retreat this last week, we were doing some, um, some more high level practices in our subtle body. For those who know about like subtle body work, it's kind of opening different channels. Um, and I was feeling really stuck especially in my head centers, really dense uh, heart, belly, no problem, but just really having a hard time. And it wasn't until I experienced kind of an emotional um, resonance. I felt like actually a sense of great loss and sorrow. And it just dropped me right into my body. My head centers open. So I could imagine, you know, I can't go back in time now, but I wonder if I could have been struck by great beauty and also had that dropping in the body and having that opening. But I, I like this recommendation of one way to start our practice. So sometimes here we'll start our practice with the handshake meditation of meeting what's difficult and being able to sit in the body with that 
than going on to a practice that's might maybe more like awareness or spacious. But this idea of starting your practice with this positive image, it's really sweet. I really like it. I'm going to try it. Um, and then, you know, it's really interesting. He just mentions here that, uh, again, especially for those of you who know some of the subtle body practices in Tibetan Buddhism, that in this book, he doesn't want us to focus on specific areas, right? Or specific channels or knots or nadis, just the whole body. That it's much kind of um, safer in a way for us to focus on the whole body unless we have really extensive and appropriate training. And um, I appreciate that because I, I have done some more specific focusing and myself, I find the whole body to be uh, a richer place. And so that's his recommendation. So I'd like us to do one more um, short practice here. As I mentioned, this is one, it's just so outrageous. I just love it. Um, he really invites us first to just consider what it is. <laughs> I love this. He says, um, visualize whatever way allows your mind to feel as if it is in touch with a vast array of cells. To make the interior of each cell more vivid and vital, you can think of each cell as having the qualities of earth, water, fire, and air. These qualities dwell in the open interior space of each cell. He literally has an image of a cell. Doesn't matter if you can't see it online. Like It's like a line drawing of the nucleus and the nuclear membrane. I'm like, this is the funniest thing. He says, as your visualization progresses, think of one or two cells. Then imagine seeing a vast number of cells, even billions. Feel and believe you are seeing a sweeping view of the infinite cells making up the parts of your body. Feel that you are not fabricating this view, that your mind is touching the infinite cells in their many different individual shapes, colors, and designs. And I, I think it's, it's very sweet. And the way that he talks about light here, he says, by imagining that each cell in your body is illuminated with radiant light, you'll be calling forth a particularly vital healing energy. Many spiritual traditions see light as associated with purity, freedom, holiness, divinity, but you need not be a religious person to sense the potential, the powerful potential of light. Light makes the plants of the earth grow, and a sunny morning can make you feel good simply by its glorious radiance. Although this book is about everyday healing, it might be helpful as background to describe in simplified terms how light is viewed in the ancient tantric sources of Nyingma Buddhism, which I practice. According to the esoteric scriptures, mind and matter in their true nature are the inseparable union of wisdom and light. All matter is light. The gross elements are earth, water, air, and fire, with the fifth being space. Each particle of the body is made of these five elements, manifested in different colors, in their true quality, the space is blue light. What well, I won't get into this, the colors because we're not going to. And he says, don't worry about the colors. And I really like, he says with this, you know, the purpose is to see yourself as a body of light. And that it helps you feel clarity, peace, and joy. Feeling luminous and insubstantial. So that you don't have a grasping and tightness around your body. Visualizing light can be an effective relief from mental tensions and worries, sadness, and pain, and produce, which produce uh, physical, mental rigidity and decay. So it's really, it's really interesting here. Um, the main instruction is really to just keep on seeing your body as made of billions of cells and that each of these cells are light, shining. And it's okay if, and he says here that, uh, feel as though radiant light were blossoming in each cell through your body, bringing health and healing. So this is a little bit of a leap from imagining our happy place, right? But I think it's another interesting extension of what can we bring into our imagination and how might it heal us? So we're going to just do this practice quite briefly, since it is, you know, I, I'd say for many of us, probably a newer practice. 
and to sit with this visualization even of our cells is, is quite interesting. So find yourself in a posture. We'll probably just do this for about five to eight minutes. So something that you can feel, again, that sense of uprightness and ease. Making our way into the feeling of our body by noticing the seams of our body, where our body is meeting the air around us. And feeling a sense of the body from within the body. Feeling the warmth and subtle movements within the body. And imagining if it's helpful either that the body is made up of all of these tiny cells or particles so much smaller than we can see and yet each part makes up this feelingness of the body itself Feeling a sense of the body from within. Feeling that these cells are throughout the body. Not just in the front of the body, not just in the back of the body. It's okay if this visualization just feels like an overall sense of the body from within, made up of so many different parts and pieces. Imagining smaller and smaller parts within smaller and smaller pieces. And with this intention of healing, imagining a sense of light, the light of the elements or the light of movement, maybe even the sunlight that has been ingested through the foods we eat. Let's feel or imagine a sense of light throughout the tiniest pieces parts and cells. Feeling this body as a body of light. Maybe this light feels like spaciousness, openness. Maybe there's a sense of a radiance or warmth. Just bringing the creativity and imagination of feeling a sense of light, inviting a sense of light deeply within each piece and part throughout the entire body.
Feel or imagine a goodness. Feel or imagine a healing potential with this light. Bringing forth the power of the mind and imagination to infuse this body with light, with healing and goodness. That sense of when you see just a little drop of dew infused with sunlight. Imagine that radiating within every single piece or particle or cell in the body. Relaxing the visualization a bit, and just feeling and noticing the sensation of imagining and inviting a body of light. Thank you for your eight minutes of willingness to be a body of light. Be so curious. Any quick reflections on that practice? It was hard to imagine light in every single cell. Yeah. It was better to do a general body. General, yeah. yeah. For me, at least. Yeah. Wait till he has you imagine a little Buddha inside every cell of every light. I was like, I'm not going to do that one. Chandra can do that one. <laughs> Anybody else? Did you notice any feeling or sensation inviting that visualization in? Yes. Hi. Hi. Hi, Kelly. Mm -hmm. In that, I wanted to guess two things. Um, one is in uh, that practice that we just did, it was helpful for me to um, have the light shot on me. Mm. Um, in that way, one uh, could direct, um, I could direct it. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> Um, and just different parts of my body. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I noticed about that is um, I just, uh, I shake um, because I, about 1997, we started having um, spontaneous Kundalini mm. um, events yeah. happening in my body. Yeah. And so, but the minute I picture the light, I'm mean, just, it's very comforting. Mm. Um, and I just noticed that my body just has this energy and it vibrates. Yep. Deeper channels. Yeah. 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 That's good. You know how to work with that. It's taken two decades. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't surprise yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to share was um, kind of going back to the happiness uh, topic. Um, I had this amazing experience that I would characterize as a spiritual experience. Um, I went to Spirit Rock for the first time. I'd never done a silent meditation before. Um, and when I came home, um, 
there was one day I was walking in the park and all of a sudden um, I had this experience of, this was last week hmm. on Thursday at six o'clock. <laughs> 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 and, um, and I had this feeling of my heart was opening. Hmm. And I live right yeah. on the edge of the tenderloin. And so I can very, I can get overwhelmed by the visuals and I can judge it. And all of a sudden, when I dropped in and my heart felt so open, hmm. um, I just heard this voice that said, like, the only thing that matters is an awakening. Hmm. And it was so interesting because um, I was filled with this incredible feeling of profuse gratitude. Hmm. Like, that for just, if I didn't feel, I mean, just to have gotten to feel that yeah. in this lifetime, yeah. I'm good, you know, I'm good because and then I, I was walking home, I was at a park and then I was walking home and then I, I sat at my altar and I just cried and mm. a huge gratitude um, to get to hear this. Um, but what I wanted to say is um, it wasn't really happiness. Yeah. It wasn't despair. It was just you know, complete presence mm. and acceptance. Yeah. And it yeah. didn't matter that, um, you know, all of the elements, and social dilemmas we see around the city, um, it, that, none of that mattered. Mm. It was like I was experiencing my life in this incarnation through a lens I've never seen mm. before. But it wasn't happy. Yeah. Yeah. But I would characterize it as positive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's extremely special. That's such a beautiful feeling of coming home to that recognition of the only thing that really matters is the awakened heart. It's such a, an, a direct experience, not a thought that that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. On that note, let's dedicate our merit. We're just taking a moment and kind of following that thread. Considering that if there's any benefit of our time here together, that we could offer it so that all beings would know their true nature. All beings would connect to their awakened heart that all beings would be free. Thank you all so much. Thank you, especially the volunteers tonight, a new volunteer tonight. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. So wonderful to be with you all. See you soon.